I thought the Bengals draft overall was good. Uh, you take a look at uh, the highs and lows. Uh, you know, Miles Murphy. Look, we, we had no idea where Miles Murphy was going to go. Uh, could have been a top 15 pick or it could have been exactly where he ended up. And so that's a, a good get for Cincinnati to have Miles Murphy at 28 overall. And they added some, you know, some nice talent. They added DJ Turner, uh, Jordan Battle. And so those two guys add to their secondary. Uh, we talked a lot about Charlie Jones and the need for the Bengals to add another key receiver in that group. And they've got him, hopefully. And they also and they also added the kid from Princeton. And uh, they were able to get Chase Brown uh, in the fifth round. And as we know, uh, with running backs, you know, you can get these guys you know, end of day two or especially in day three or even free agency. And you never know uh, when you're going to get lucky. So Chase Brown has the ability uh, to definitely be one of the guys that could pan out. But yeah, I, 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 those, especially those first what five picks, uh, I felt, hey, these are guys that are going to, especially, and Murphy at the top, these are guys that definitely will contribute. Yeah, I mean, they're four deep at the end right now. You know, I mean, you have your starters in Hubbard and Hendri- Hendrickson, good starting pair. Joseph Osai really started to break out towards the end of the last year. Yes. You know, I know the penalty in the Kansas City playoff game is kind of like a, a blip on the radar, but overall he was playing quality football. Now they have Miles Murphy. So that that's a nice, you know, if he works out, that's a really good, really good four-man front. I still think they're weak inside, though. You know, to me, DJ Reader, BJ yes. Hill, solid players, but you'd rather have someone a little bit better in front of them. Yep. Um, and then the depth behind them is is really weak. Yep. It did sound like they were looking at D tackle. It just didn't work out. They didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of bullets to to try to trade up with. So you know, they kind of double dipped on the secondary. You know, their first three picks in this draft were on defense, right? And two of those were on the secondary. Last year, they used a first and a second. Um, in the secondary. So you can kind of see where this team is kind of trending towards in terms of investing talent, investing resources. And, you know, is that going to work out? Do you see these guys being the difference makers when you face off against Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen, uh, Lamar Jackson, even in the playoffs? Uh, so I, I don't think the draft went the way that they wanted it to go, but the players they got, it kind of does fit into what they currently have. So it's Instead of them strengthening the weaknesses on that roster, they kind of just put more resources into where they were already strong, if that makes sense. Yeah, and look, we know that they needed you're, – you're moving on from the two veteran safeties. And Hill pretty much redshirted last year. Right. Now you bring in Nick Scott, doesn't have all the great stats and looks like, wow, this guy, big addition. No, but Bengals must feel is an excellent fit somehow. And then just in case you add in Jordan Battle, so mm. now and what's 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 what you like about it? Again, this is what this is what the Bengals have to do. This is what the Bengals like to do. It's about drafting. You draft, you develop these players, and now they've got a bunch of nice young players to develop. We talked about Cam Taylor Britt and how he did a successful first rookie season. Uh, what about DJ Ivy uh, and DJ Turner? I know they're completely different, second round, seventh round, uh, but uh, uh, starting with Turner. Uh, what's his ceiling? I mean, athletically, he's as good as it gets. And this is a position you have to be overly athletic. You you know, this is the position that those numbers that he put up, you know, the at the 40 and some of the historic numbers that he has, three cone, the short shuttle, they matter a lot. And if he can – and he, you look at his tape, there's enough quality tape there to say this kid knows what he's doing. My question with him is where are you putting him? Are you putting him outside? Are you putting him in the slot? I do think he could do both. My question is how much impact he can make at the point of attack. Can he jam a receiver, prevent them from getting off the line well enough? Uh, And that's the one weakness I had on him in college. And I don't want to put him in his own scheme. I don't think you're really using his athletic ability in that role. So as a man cover guy that needs to play off a little bit to really get the most out of himself, um, I just think the ceiling of his impact is not that high. Right. I had a day two, early day three grade on him for that reason. I think he could be a good player that'll be around for a long time. He could protect, he could, you know, protect the top of the defense a little bit. But, um, you know, in terms of, but I will say the one positive here, he adds a skill set that a lot of these other corners don't have. So, and they have a really good defensive line running the show there. They know, they know how to coach football there in Cincinnati on the defensive side of the ball. So I trust that they can use their, his strengths to balance out what they currently have at that group. Okay. 
an Ivy, is he just a special teamer or is he somebody to keep an eye on? They brought him in for a 30 visit. You know, there, there's a lot of interest there. Tools, tools, rich, uh, his best tape. You can make the case that is just up there with Stevenson, the corner that got drafted by Chicago much earlier in the draft. Uh, but he's just a really inconsistent player, lacks feel, lacks consistent impact, lacks technique work. So they'll probably stash him on the practice squad or the, on the back end of the roster, may, let him play some specials as a gunner, um, has the speed to make an impact there. But he's more of a long-term project okay. type. On offense, uh, you take a look at the two receivers. Again, we talked about Charlie Jones. You can see the difference with Charlie Jones from Iowa to Purdue based on – whether or not you want to say scheme and or talent. So now he goes to Joe Burrow and yeah. how can you not land in a better spot? Not only for Charlie Jones, but it just makes, this is what's so great when you're a general manager and you strike it and you hit it with the quarterback. Now yep. you can kind of fit, fit, put guys in there that, yeah, you know what? If he was on this team, he'd be just okay. But you put him with my guy, and he could be that much more of a difference maker. So great spot for for the Bengals. They needed depth. They got it, and they also used up a six round draft pick there as well. Yeah, yeah. Jones is your safety net. You know he's going to be a player. You don't. You know he doesn't have the ceiling uh, as the kid from Penn State, uh, Princeton. But inside out versatility comes from a pro style offense, which does matter. Um, also brings a lot of punt return value. So there's just a lot of boxes that Jones can check, right? He's going to back up inside and outside right away. So if someone goes down, he will be the guy. I bet he's the number four receiver by the mid midway point through the season, if not earlier. Well, he's battling um, Trenton Irwin. So right, yeah, honestly, so that that path is going to be pretty easy, yeah. and also adds punt return value. And so uh, I, I love the pick. I love the fit. And I think it gives them the option that if they want to let Boyd walk in free agency or cut him loose at some point, he can easily be, uh, be the guy to fill in that role and they don't go back one, uh, one bit. Um, the kid from Princeton, the physical package there is so special. And to, you know, this is what you do day three, especially late day three, is you find the best tools out there. And, you know, I don't want to say you hope, but you, that, that's what you want to develop over the course of a year or two. You're not really counting on him to contribute right away, but the tools he has – other than Jamar Chase, there's not a receiver on this team that has the tools that this kid does. So if he can learn under these guys, you could develop them and insert them into the office next year or the year after. Great value. Right. And I love I love the I love the punter pick in the sixth round. I think Brad Robbins was a really I thought he was my number one punter in the class. And I think that he could be the guy that's gonna, you know, help them win the position field position battle, which for a team like this, you know, late in the year, it's gonna matter. Okay. So on the punter situation though. What is it about Drew Chrisman that, I mean, shouldn't this be a situation where if you're another team in the NFL and you see this, that you're mm -hmm. going, oh, okay, I need a young punter. I'm about to get yeah. one. Yeah. And the question is, do you want to beat everyone else to the chase and give a future seven for him? Why not? Which is probably, or do you want to wait and maybe do some, you know, talking with the agent about, hey, if and when this kid gets cut, I mean, you have to imagine he's going to get cut yeah. at some point after training camp when they cut down the rosters. Hey, we want first look at him, you know, and that's that's the side of the business that I'm not involved with at all, but I'm sure it gets pretty, pretty uh, dirty, pretty nasty. So, you know, if you're a team that you don't have that relationship with the agent, um, you don't have the relationship with Chrisman, then, yeah, you might want to send a future seven if you're someone that's in need of a punt. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to, hopefully, John Sheeran, who covers the Bengals, uh, about this because he'll know a lot more about this Drew Chrisman deal. All I know is he was an elite punter in college. Seemed like he did a decent job last year when he got his chance. But apparently there's something about him that the Bengals were not comfortable with. So um, I'll be able to find that out with uh, when we talk to John, hopefully sometime soon. And uh, they also, as far as free agency uh, after the draft, picks up Jackson, uh, excuse me, Jackson Kirkland. And we know he has uh, a lot of experience and played really, you know, solid college football. Um, a player that a couple of years ago people thought could have been a late first round draft pick. But, mm -hmm. you know, there have been a lot of issues since then, including the injuries. So to get him as a free agent, hey, why not? Yeah, really good pickup there on a team that I think there's going to be a spot for someone to come out of nowhere. And, you know, they right now they roll eight or nine deep. You know, Lel Collins, I'm not really sure what they're going to do with him long term, but there's a spot for him on that roster that I think he can beat a couple of these guys out. Max Sharping being, you know, the one that I'm really looking at right now that I think he can beat out. 
Um, undrafted, I love two of the guys they had defensively, Devontae Maxwell from Chattanooga okay. on a team that we talked about. They need the uh, interior disruptors, and I think he'll be right up there with some of the best on that group okay. You know, in, in terms of the depth chart. And keep an eye on Shaka Hayward, linebacker from Duke. I had a draftable grade on him. Thought that he could have been a fifth round pick in the draft. And, you know, it is a little bit of a crowded group, and they don't play a ton of uh, football with more than two linebackers on the field. But when you're talking about the talent, versatility, what he could do on uh, on special teams, he's going to make a name for himself. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we were talking, when we went over the draft, we were talking about how, believe it or not, Cincinnati, with all their problems on the offensive line, it is not a big need. And I'm right. positive. There were tons of analysts and fans that were thinking, well, what's your top three needs? Well, you definitely offensive line's one of them. Well, no, uh, it really wasn't. They have some good depth there now, and they did not – I mean, pretty much, they, they – Kirkland was it. So yeah. we'll find out what happens, and especially if Jonah Williams hangs on. That's, that's the last big deal because if they lose him – in any way, you would think that they're going to have to find an, a, another at least uh, solid backup guy um, yeah. to Collins. 